Hey YouTube, welcome back to Math Monday. Today we're gonna to be talking about options, specifically European options. We're gonna be discussing the two different types of European options, the different positions that you could take in either contract and their payoff at maturity. So I know this is Math Monday, but I'm also considering adding Finance Fridays where we dedicate more time to these different types of topics, maybe option pricing, maybe bond pricing, et cetera. So if this is something you're interested in, be sure to leave a comment below, like this video, and let me know. So a European option is going to give the holder of the contract the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell some underlying good at a pre-specified price at a pre-specified time in the future. So let's go ahead and talk about that statement because there's a lot going on. To help with this explanation, I am going to draw a timeline. So we are going to start at T0 and we are going to work our way up to capital T. Now you can think of T0 as some contemporaneous time or you know today or right now and capital T as some time in the future, maybe a month out, a few months out, or even a few years out. This is the first parameter of our option contract, this capital T. It is going to determine the date in which we are going to be able to buy or sell the underlying security. The other parameter is going to be the strike price of the option contract. The strike price is going to determine the price in which we are buying or selling at in the future. And this is typically denoted as K. So when you're specifying a European option, you're going to have some time in the future in which you're going to exercise that contract at the strike price K. To further illustrate this option contract, let's consider the underlying in which we're buying and selling. Let's suppose we have some underlying equity, let's say Apple, for example. And we'll say that Apple today is trading at $120 per share. Now at time T in the future, perhaps this is going to be one year in the future, we would like to purchase Apple at $120 per share. That would make our strike price K $120. This means there's going to be some cash flow at time capital T. So at time capital T, we are going to get some cash flow, but what does this cash flow look like? Well, it's going to be based on two things. It's going to be based on the price of Apple and the strike price. Now, we don't actually know what the price of Apple is going to be one year in the future. So, for example, if Apple was $150, for example, so let's say in the future Apple is $150, then we would have the right but not obligation to buy Apple at $120. So that would mean if we bought Apple at 120 and immediately resold it for 150, we would be left with a $30 profit. But if Apple declines in value, let's say that Apple is trading at maybe $90 per share, then if we exercise, we would end up losing money, right? So minus 120, that would be negative $30. But remember, we have the right, not the obligation, to buy Apple. Thus, we don't need to do anything. We can just let the option expire worthless. Now, what are the implications of this option contract? Well, if I held this option contract, then in one case, if Apple increases in value, I make money. In another case, if Apple declines in value, nothing happens. I don't make money, I don't lose money, I just don't exercise the contract. So what is the point of this, right? Like who would be on the other side of this contract knowing that they're just in a position to either lose money or have nothing happen. Well, that is where the price of the option contract comes in. There is a fee that I will pay to have the right but not the obligation to buy or sell at some time in the future. And this opens the door to the entire field of derivatives pricing. So it is a very deep sea. We're not gonna cover any of it in this video, 
but just know that the price attached to an option is a very big question in the quantitative finance literature. That means in reality, the cash flow at time T is going to be independent of the price that we pay for the contract at the contemporaneous time or today T0. So at T0, we also have a cash flow and this is going to be negative P where P is the price of our option. So that means our profit from the option contract that we buy is going to be say $30 minus P. So in general, it will be the payout of the option less the price that we paid for that particular option. There's actually a more general way we can write this. So if I was to go ahead here and quickly erase the cash flows at time capital T, we can consider Apple to be equal to S of T zero. This is the value of one share of Apple stock at time T zero. Now at time capital T, we don't know what Apple is going to be priced at, but we can represent it as S sub capital T. So S sub capital T is going to be the price of Apple stock at time T in the future, in this case, one year. We just saw two states of the world, one where we exercised the contract at maturity, where we made $30, and one where we chose not to do anything as we would have lost money. There's a mathematical representation for this called a max function. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take the price at time capital T of Apple and subtract our strike price and consider the maximum of this value with zero. If we plug in the numbers from before, then we can see that if Apple is 150 and we were to subtract 120, we would get 30 and zero in our max function, in which case we would get the $30 output. And if we had the 90 in the other state of the world, then the max function would yield the max between negative 30 and zero, which is of course going to be zero. So this is a mathematical way to determine whether or not we exercise the contract at expiration. This is the options payoff function. Now, specifically, this is for a call option, but we'll get to that in a moment. For now, I just want to leave you with the idea that this is the payoff. If we wanted to find the profit, then we would actually take this max function and we would end up subtracting the price that we paid for the option. So it would be max of S sub cap T minus K and zero minus P, where P is the price we paid for our option. So in this case here, this is the payoff function. And in this case here, this is our profit function. So as I mentioned, that is for the call options, specifically European call options. And we can visualize the price at expiration. So at that time, capital T, as this max function on a chart. Traditionally, these are referred to as the hockey stick diagram. So if I was to go here and draw these axes, I have X, which is going to be the stock price at time, capital T. So this is going to be S sub capital T. The Y axis is going to be our payoff. Then the function would look something like this, where this point here is K. So as you can see, it is zero all the way until the point that S sub cap T is greater than K. Then we start to receive a payoff from the option. So this is specifically the payoff function for a European call. So this is a European call option where we have the right to buy at some point in the future, time capital T, at price K. 
there is another type of contract called a European put, where instead of the right to buy at some point in the future, it is the right to sell. And hopefully, relatively intuitively, we can simply flip the payoff function to represent this. So we can just say at time capital T for a put option, specifically a European put, we have the max between K minus S sub cap T and zero. And that is the payoff function for a European put. If we wanted the profit function, we would simply also subtract the price of that put contract. So I would just say max of K minus S sub T zero minus P, where we have our payoff function once again, and this is our profit function. Once again, we can draw this hockey stick diagram for a put option. It's gonna look something like this, where we have K here, but this time it is going to be going backwards. Now, this Y axis is still the payoff, and this X axis is still S sub cap T, where we're working with a European put. But in this case, you'll notice that the profit is actually bounded. The profit is bounded as the highest value that we can get for this profit function, or rather this payoff function, is going to be K. So the maximum profit here that we can receive, or the maximum payoff rather, is going to be K. So we looked at two examples here. We have the right to buy and the right to sell. But somebody's on the other side of that contract, meaning that somebody is actually letting you buy from them or letting you sell to them. The person that is on the other side of that contract is considered to have a short position. So there are actually four charts for us to consider. And I'm gonna draw four down here. One, two, and then three, four. And I wanna consider the four different charts which refer to a long position and a short position in a European call and a European put. I'm gonna create fixed columns and rows for long and short positions and call and put options. So I'm gonna say that this column is going to be long positions, this column is short positions, this row is call options, and this row is put options. Now we've seen a long call and a long put. We know that a long call looks something like this. We know a long put looks something like this. And a short call and a short put are very simply these charts flipped on the X axis. So a short call is going to look like this. And then a short put is going to look like this. It is simply the other side of the contract. Thus, when the payoff is greater than zero, the payoff for the person in the short position is going to be negative. Let's draw these with respect to the profit now. So we know that when you are long a contract, you have to buy the contract. If I want to take a long position or have the right but not obligation to buy or sell in the future, that's going to cost me some certain amount of money, P. Otherwise, I can achieve a profit or nothing without paying any price. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, we shift this hockey stick diagram down by P. So this gap here is the price we pay for the option. This is the price we pay for a call option. That being said, the short position is actually going to be shifted up by this P. That is because they get the premium for taking the other side of the option. This is exactly why this exists in a marketplace at all. If there was no compensation for the risk of taking on perhaps losing a lot of money with respect to the spot in the future, nobody would take that, that contract, or I hope nobody would take that contract. 
So this is where the profit function comes into play and it makes sense as to why anybody would agree to this arrangement in the first place. So when we're looking at the puts, a similar thing happens. We shift down, this gap here is P and we also shift up and this gap here is P. So with respect to the payoffs, we are shifting up and down depending on which side of the contract we are on. If we're long the call or long the put, we have to buy it, so we shift the payoff function down. If we are short, then we shift it up because we're receiving that money in exchange for potentially having to agree to these obligations in the future. That's gonna do it for this Math Monday on European options. I hope you enjoy it. I know this topic can be a little tricky at first, especially when you're learning about the different sides of an option contract that you can partake in, whether it be long or short but hopefully the visualizations made it a little easier to understand. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If you have any suggestions for future videos, or if you would like Finance Fridays where we cover this and similar topics potentially in Excel, please be sure to let me know as well in the comments below. Uh, we just launched our first course, Introduction to Python on quantguild.com. Use code SUMMER2022 for a limited time to get $50 off. But other than that, thank you so much for watching and I will see you on Workshop Wednesday.